let me help you understand something. Giving is part of initiating breakthrough. How many need to come to a different level financially? You don't do that without giving. I mean, I can just tell you, we've been in ministry for the whole 38 years of our marriage, and I can tell you we gave our way out of debt. We gave our way out of poverty. We gave our way into the blessing of the Lord. Now, I've got a prophetic word for you this morning. Um, I actually, a couple of months ago, I was on an airplane, and I was flying somewhere, and I had a dream. And God speaks to me a lot in dreams. And so in this dream, the Spirit of the Lord came and said to me, tell my people I'm bringing them into a time called crazy increase. Crazy, and just say it, crazy increase. Because it feels so good just to say it. And then I had this whole dream. Everything that I'm going to tell you right now, I dreamed from the Lord. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord began to take me to um, uh, Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, which many of you may know. Um, but there was a famine in the land that Isaac was living in, in Genesis 26. And it says that in verse 12, it says, Isaac sowed in the land in the time of famine. Let me just stop and just say, that makes no sense at all. You know, when there's no rain and there's famine in the land, it does not make any sense to take your seed and put it in the ground. Does it? Does that make sense? Okay. But he put his seed in the ground in the time of famine, and it says, and it says, and uh, and he reaped a hundredfold, everybody say a hundredfold, in the same year, in the same year. And then it says, the man began to prosper. How many of you are believing that God's going to cause you to begin to prosper? The man began to prosper, and he continued prospering. How many want to continue prospering? Until he became very prosperous. How many are shooting for the very prosperous, okay? Okay. How many understand, how many get it that it's really not about the money? It's about the resources to do and obey the will of God. I talk to so many people that go, yeah, I'm going to do what God said as soon as dot, 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 something financial. How, how many of you feel like you've been in this kind of stuck position because you feel like God has said something to you, but you don't have the money to do what God said? Let's, let's just be honest. Let me just say this. Everybody that's hand is up. God is so happy with you. You know why? Because you should always have a bigger vision than what's in your bank account. You should always have something that's a, gr a greater vision than what you actually have in your hand. But guess, guess what? The word provision, get this, means before the vision. So in other words, before God gave you that vision, he already had provision for the vision we just have to access it. Well, how do we access it? We access it through sowing. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. In my dream, the Lord gave me Genesis 26, 12. And then he said to me in my dream, he said, the people of God are reading that scripture wrong. And I knew I was. The Lord said, I did not say I would give you a hundred times. He said, I would give you a hundred fold. So let me help you to understand the difference between a hundred times and a hundred fold. If you sow a dollar, what is a hundred times that dollar? Y'all are great mathematicians. A hundred dollars. Excellent. If you sow a dollar and receive a hundred fold, let me help you understand how this works. Um, okay. Can I have this? Okay. This is your dollar. We're going to give more than a dollar. Okay. You fold that in half once. That's one fold. How many do you have? You fold it in half again. That's two fold. How many do you have? Four. You fold it in half again. I'm not going to be able to do this to a hundred fold. But how many do you have? Eight. You fold it in half again. This is now four fold. Now what is this? Sixteen. You fold it in half again. Now this is five fold. How many do you have? Thirty-two. If you continue that to a hundred times, y'all ready for this number? I didn't even know this number existed. Okay, it means it is the number one no nillion. No, did anybody know there was a number? When you go home, ask Suri to tell you what no nillion is. It's so funny. She'll go, no nillion, 
one zero 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 it's so funny you need to go home and do it listen to this number one no million two hundred one octillion sixty four septillion five hundred ninety five sextillion two hundred seven quintillion one hundred sixty seven quadrillion six hundred eighty five trillion eight hundred eighty two billion four hundred thirty one million three hundred thirty three thousand six hundred and 16. So we have thought 100 times. God says 100 fold. I think that's crazy increase. Crazy increase. So when I shared this this one night, um, there was a man in the congregation and he sowed, he sowed a seed and the next day he had been in litigation um, with a, a lien against a property um, and and uh, he had a lien removed for $750,000 the next morning. He had been in that litigation for over a year. My husband and I sowed a seed, and I can tell you that we received a hundredfold within a, wo- within a week, but I'm looking for the no nillion. How many, how, many of us, how many of us get that we have been so limited in our minds, and the Lord confronted me and said, you know what, we got to start breaking off mindsets. And then, I, then I, I, I heard the Lord say that we're in a super bloom season. So here's the understanding of a super bloom. A super bloom happens out in, um, on deserts, okay? And this year, actually, in California, is actually a super bloom season. And out in the deserts, like in Arizona and all of that. And so what happens in a super bloom season is that um, seeds that have gone down into the ground out in the desert go down into the ground, and sometimes those seeds will sit there for 5, 10, even 15 years. It's the coolest thing. You can go look it up. I, everything I'm telling you is scientific. But what causes the seed to come into a super bloom is, is that there's usually some kind of harsh condition that comes. Remember the fires in California? They set California up for a super bloom season. The fires agitate the ground. How many of you have been through some agitation? Okay. How many remember in World War I ever hearing about Flanders Field? The field of poppies? Okay, the most of the older generation, most of you are looking at me like, I have no idea what you're talking I am not old enough to know about World War I, okay? I've studied this, all right? So... In World War I, they had this field that ended up becoming the trenches. You've seen the trenches, okay? It ended up becoming the trenches, and it was called, before that, it was called Flanders Field. But after that, and it was just like farming, everything like that. After World War I, after the troops were there, after the boots of the army, after the bloodshed, after the horror of war, after all of that, the next year, the field burst out in a super bloom. Now, I need you guys to stand up because you're going to do a prophetic act. You're going to start agitating. Come on, taking your feet and agitating. Just like in World War I, the, the soldier's boots agitated the ground. Just like out in the desert, the, the fire and the drought and the flames and the hardship have agitated the ground. Come on, God wants to bring us into a time of supernatural increase, crazy increase, but sometimes we've got to recognize that there's, been a, that there's an agitation of the ground where we've sowed seed. Now take this out of just the financial realm into the understanding of what God God's doing prophetically. God is causing the prophetic words that have come over our life to, that have been in the ground, some of them for five years and 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. God is saying, I'm taking the harshness of this last season. I'm ch- taking the challenge of this last season and I'm agitating that seed. And the Lord says, I am decreeing over your life, over your family, over your health, over your finances. I am decreeing a super bloom season, declares the Lord. I think we need to shout to God and we need we need to shout for that super bloom and we need to rejoice (laughs) for a time of crazy crazy increase. Father, we bless this time of giving. I thank you, God, that we're grabbing hold of heaven today and we're sowing seed that's going to spring forth this year, Father God, in a hundredfold return in Jesus' name. I feel loved and received. 
My brown daughter. She, that's how she always signs her emails to me. My brown daughter. Amen. <laughs> she met with Bishop Hammond one day, and he said, she said something about being black, and he went, are you black? <laughs> Bishop, got to love him. Bishop's 85 years old this year. He still, he still travels about 200,000 miles a year. He says, I'm going to live till I die. I think that's a, great, uh, that's a great philosophy, isn't it? A great philosophy. I feel very welcome, very received in this, in this region. And I, I want you to understand, I, I'm in and out I, every, every single week I'm on the road. And I, I turned to, to, to Tricia and I said, there's something in this region that makes revelation flow very easily. Do, do y'all feel that? There's this openness in the spirit. There's times, I mean, when, when you carry the prophetic in you, you don't, <laughs> let me just tell you, you don't always depend on somebody else there opening it up for you. You've got to carry it in you and have the capacity to, to walk in that break or anointing yourself. But they've, they've done so much of the work in breaking it open. So could I just honor uh, pastor, the pastors, the Rosells right now. Father, we just honor Peter and Trish. Lord, thank you so much for this couple. Their, their work and the watchmen in this house, your work in the spirit is evident. I can tell you that. It's very, very evident um, here in the spirit. It's, you can tell that this, this region has got some contending to do, but you can definitely tell that you guys have opened, an, opened the atmosphere over this area. It's so interesting that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach out of Luke chapter 1 today. So I got a good word when you gave that word. So if you don't mind, open up your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 1. Um, you know, I, when I walked in here this morning for prayer, um, there, there was a birthing, a travailing anointing that was happening. And I, I just want to point out, last night, if you weren't here last night, I shared that this region that you see over here on this map, the, the uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, represents the neck of the nation. And remember, it's, it's the neck that turns the head, okay? Okay. Um, and then, but what we also have to understand is that that narrow place is also a gate, and that narrow place is also a birth canal. And so you're going to probably find yourself in seasons of birthing um, up in this region, probably more often than you're not birthing. Okay? Um, I had three children in three and a half years. I was exhausted, okay? Okay. <laughs> Three children in three and a half years. We um, we also birthed our church during that time because we didn't have anything else to do, um, and we were birthing the prophetic movement. Okay, at the same time. So in that period of time, so I described that to you because that's that's the season you guys are in, and I just believe that God's going to give you supernatural grace and supernatural strength to do multiple births at the same time. I know y'all are like exhausted with this word already, okay? But let me just tell you, I had a man that came up to me years later and he said, he said, it is so good to see you doing everything you do in ministry. And I said, oh, well, thank you. And he goes, no, no, what I mean to say is I was around back in the early days when you had three little kids and a new church and a, and a, and a budding prophetic ministry and you were the dance team and you were the worship team and you were the prophetic team and you were the setup team and the teardown team. And, you did, and he said, I didn't think you were going to make it. <laughs> I said, there were definitely days that I didn't think I was going to make it either, okay? Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about birthing, and that's why I've taken you to Luke chapter 1, because uh, it's the story of, of Mary giving birth. It's the story of Elizabeth giving birth to John the Baptist, and Mary giving birth um, really to to the Son of God. And I, I you know, there's such, I, I felt such an anointing on the, the prayer that I prayed this morning about harvest in this region. And I felt like the Lord, I felt like the Lord said, if you'll contend for it, there's an initial tithe of the population. I don't even know what the population is, but that's millions of people, guys. 10% of the population. I believe that it'll go higher, but I believe that that's going to be, the tithe will be the mothers and fathers that will help to steward. You're, you're, you're praying right now to harvest the harvesters. Who's, who's active in this region right now is not enough to steward the actual harvest. So right now I believe you need to be praying for the harvest of the harvesters. 
the mothers and the fathers and those that will make disciples of the coming massive harvest. Okay, so there's a harvesting of the harvesters that will need to be actively trained. And so if you're kind of sitting back in a church right now and you don't have a whole lot of responsibility, get ready because there's getting ready to be an influx coming in and it's going to be all hands on deck. Okay, when you give, when you give birth to multiple babies, I only ever gave birth one at a time, okay? But <laughs> when you give birth to multiple babies, you need a lot of hands and you need a lot of help. And so I want you to have that image and understand that that's the season that, that you're coming into is, is a birthing season because you're birthing that which is preparation for the harvest season that's up here. And, and so this region really is like a spiritual womb. Think about all the things that come out of New York. Think about all the things that come out of this region in a bad way. Okay, because see what the enemy does is he comes in and he takes advantage of a womb. Upstate New York is a massive spiritual womb. A demonic, a de, so many demonic things have been birthed out of there. Um, so many um, false moves, false prophetic, false apostolic. The whole uh, Mormon thing, you know, happened up there. And um, so much of spiritism happened up there. The occult. All of these are, are false apostolic and false prophetic. God, God is turning things around now. See, remember what, what, God de- what the enemy decrees over a region, God initially decreed. Think of all the things, and, I, and I'm going to challenge you to start thinking about all the, the things, good or bad, that have birthed out of this region. And understand that this region is a womb. It's a womb for our nation. It's a womb for revival. It's a womb for harvest. And the individuals inside this room, you have a spiritual womb. And if you're prophetic, you begin to understand that our job as prophets is not just to prophesy, but it's to incubate. It's to, to carry in our spiritual womb that which needs to be birthed. Because, see, Mary carried something. She had destiny in her womb. She had something in her womb that could change the world, that would change the world. You have something in your spiritual womb, collectively, corporately, and individually, that has the capacity to change the world. Are there any world changers in here? Are there any people that, that imagine themselves as world changers? Well, let me just, let me just tell you a little bit of something. Um, uh, Bishop Hammond, my father-in-law, is really considered to be the father of the modern prophetic movement. And by the way, if you can't come and spend three months with us, which we'd would really love to have you for three months, second week in September is a week-long training. Uh, we'd love to train you in the prophetic. It's what we, what we do best. We're, we're, we're excellent at this. And one of the greatest testimonies that we do have is not just that CI people can prophesy, but that they have the character and they have the integrity. And let me just tell you, that makes my mama heart really, really happy uh, when I hear that testimony. But Bishop Hammond came into the kingdom. Bishop Hammond was a hillbilly. There's just no nice way to say it, okay? He was a total, when, when Mom Hammond married him, she said, oh my God, I've married the Beverly Hillbillies, okay? Because when she went, she was from Washington State, and she was a farm girl. She was raised on the farm. But when she came to visit Bishop's family, um, they, didn't, they didn't even have an outhouse, Like, they had a trail into the woods, okay? They were the Beverly Hillbillies. They didn't have electricity. They still drew water from a well. You know, they were, they were from the hills of Oklahoma. That's where Bishop Hammond came from. And he was, he was a hard-headed, stubborn. His dad was an alcoholic, would beat him with a two-by-four, and he'd turn around and cuss him. And then his dad would beat him again, and he'd turn and cuss him. He was a, he was a hard-headed guy. Okay, his bus driver at school said that guy's either going to be a murderer or a preacher. Okay, so thank God he became a preacher. All right. So when he when he was 16 years old, he followed a girl that he was interested in to a brush arbor meeting. How many have ever heard of a brush arbor meeting? It's down in the in the south. A couple hands went up. Down in the south, they'd cut down uh, some trees. They'd cut down some brush. They'd kind of put it like, like poles over just to kind of keep the heat of the sun off. And then they'd have like, like benches made out of logs and stuff like that. And people would come and they would worship and then they would preach. And so this woman preacher back in the 50s, did y'all hear me say woman preacher in the 50s, they would not let her in the churches. 
So you know what she did? She traveled from town to town on horseback and would do these brush arbor meetings because the churches wouldn't let her in. And she would go out and she would preach. And that night, July the 29th, Bishop Hammond followed a girl to the Brush Arbor meeting, sat in the back with his friends, making fun of what was going on. And suddenly he heard the gospel preached. And that night, with tears streaming down his face, he gave his heart to Jesus, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and his life was changed forever, and my life was changed forever, and Elizabeth's life was changed forever, and Josiah's life was then changed forever. Can you see what happened? See, that woman was actually carrying something that would change the world. Now, understand this. We don't remember her name, and she went on to the next town with only two converts out of those whole meetings, but she didn't realize that the one guy that got saved became the father of the modern prophetic movement. We, we, ne we don't understand what we carry. We don't understand the person that we pray for, that we give that word to. We don't understand that person that we might minister to, even in a grocery. We don't know who they, who they grow up to be. We don't know who they go on in the kingdom to become. As a matter of fact, you know, I was, I was not... Um, raised in church. I wasn't saved till I was 14. I have a real interesting testimony. My parents are from this region. Um, my, my mom was from Pennsylvania. My dad's from New Jersey. And I come from a long, long, long line of unbelievers. I'm the first believer in my family. All my family line, I'm the first believer. And God put his hand on me and drew me to him from the time that I was very, very young. I didn't get saved till I was 14. I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 16. My parents thought it was just a phase I was going through. I'm still going through the phase, okay? <laughs> I will tell you, since that time, my mom and dad have both, both gotten saved. I'm still believing for my brothers, but both my mom and dad have received the Lord. My 96-year-old grandfather received the Lord six months before he died. I'm telling you that God's doing something and he's bringing a harvest out of the unbelief. We can call the prodigals back, those that have been in church that are no longer in church. And I believe that there's a harvest of prodigals, but I believe there's a harvest of unbelievers that are going to become reformers that are going to turn this world upside down. Amen. So how many have some of those in your family? Prodigals from the church or a harvest of unbelievers. Amen. And so when I, got, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, when I was 16 years old, I, I, when I got saved, I was in a Baptist church. And, um, but when I was 16 years old, I met some spirit-filled kids, and, and they, I, had, uh, I was a state-level gymnast, and I had blew my, I'd blown my knee out. And they said to me, oh, well, God made you. He can heal you. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. So they just prayed for me, and I got healed, okay? So then I went home to tell my parents I didn't need the knee surgery that was scheduled, and my parents rolled their eyes, and they had this look on their face like, oh, my God, my daughter is a religious fanatic, okay? <laughs> and I still went through knee surgery, and the, doc the, the final thing was the doctor says, I don't know how I could have misdiagnosed you because there was nothing wrong with your knee. And it, it was just built up of testimonies to my parents. Well, at 16 years old, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, um, I... I had a dream. I had a visitation from the Lord, actually. It wasn't a dream. But I was praying by myself in my room, and the, the Lord spoke to me in an audible voice, and that was my first encounter with anything about the voice of God or the prophetic. I got saved in a Baptist church. Do you remember me saying that? Okay, and they didn't believe, back, this Baptist church did not believe in the move of the Holy Spirit. And so nobody had told me that God was still speaking today. So, number one, when I was on my knees praying in my room, it shocked me that God was speaking. I was like, whoa, what is that? But then even more was what he said to me. Because this is what God said. He said, the plans that you've made for your life are not the plans I've made for your life. And he said, instead of going to that university, I already had a full ride scholarship to a university. Instead of going to that college, he said, I'm going to send you to Bible college. And I thought, oh, my parents are going to love that. Okay, when you get there, you're going to meet a man. And if my husband was here, he would say a handsome, anointed, wonderful man. Okay, <laughs> he is. Yes. And you're going to get married young. Again, something my parents will love. And the Lord says, I'm going to thrust you into ministry and I'm going to send you to the nations of the earth. 
And sometimes he'll preach and sometimes you'll preach because I'm going to make you a team. Right there, God laid out my entire life in one prophetic word. The voice of the Lord is powerful, I'm telling you. And it is a force. And so after that point, I, I changed the plans. My parents were not happy. They negotiated every which way they could. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I went to Bible college. I met my, my future husband the first day on Bible college campus. But let me back up for just a minute because basically that prophetic word set the course for my life. So I went to my Baptist pastor to tell him I was so excited. God had spoken to me. God had given me the plans for my life. How many know God knows what your life is supposed to be? Okay? I was a straight-A student. My parents felt like I was certainly not going to live up to my potential. I think they're happy now. But they, they certainly were concerned that I was... This is what they said to me. They said, they said, when you became a Christian, we were concerned because you were throwing your mind away to believe all that stuff. But now that you're wanting to go into ministry, you're throwing your life away. Isn't that interesting? So I run to my Baptist pastor. I don't have anybody else to talk to about this. So I run to my Baptist pastor, and I tell him what God said to me. He drops his arm around my shoulder, and he says, Girly, that was not God. Because women don't preach. And then a few days later, I was kindly asked not to come back to my church. Why am I telling you this story? Because there's a price to pay to follow God. Your price is going to look different than my price, and I'm telling you what I paid years and years and years ago. But let me just show you the faithfulness of God. God spoke to me. God gave me a word. How many of you have a word? How many of you have a word about your destiny, about your future, about things that God's spoken to you, about what your life is going to look like? I, I didn't have any paradigm for what God was saying to me. I'd never seen a woman preacher. I'd never seen a woman do much of anything in the church except play the piano and sing in the choir and maybe teach Sunday school, okay? But, but, I, but, I want you, but I want you to know that when he told me that and he dismissed me, it was probably one of the hardest things I'd ever gone through, one of the best things that could have happened to me, okay? Because I didn't, I didn't understand. But I went to another church about a week and a half after I was asked to leave the church and I was visiting some church with my new spirit-filled friends because my old friends were told they couldn't have anything to do with me. And they were told that if I, that, to not even speak to me. So these were, I mean, God has actually restored all those relationships, but, but, they were, but I was completely cut off because they really believed that I was in a cult. They really did. They believed that I was in a cult. And so that was the only, they came to my parents, my unbelieving parents, and told my parents I was in a cult. And so my parents wanted to restrict my, um, my church going. They had, they'd already wanted to restrict it. Now they had an excuse to restrict it. Um, but my parents had made this mistake in raising me, is that they, they had a philosophy of supporting the child's decision-making. They reiterated this over and over. You support the child's decision-making. And so I just said to mom, Mom, You've raised, you said that you would support my decision-making. So I kind of used their upbringing against them, okay? Um, but anyways, I went to this church two weeks after I got thrown out of the Baptist church, and it was a charismatic, it was a hippie church. I call it the hippie church because the entire worship team looked like ZZ Top, okay? They had, like, they had beards that came all the way down here. They would fit in really good today. They all had holes in their jeans that weren't put there on purpose, okay? And none of them had shoes on, and they all rocked out on guitars, okay? It was like the ZZ Top Church, okay? So the pastor was a, a, a drug dealer that had gotten saved and was preaching the gospel, and, and it was a wild crowd, okay? If my parents saw these people, they definitely would keep me from going to church, okay? But I came into that church, and at the end of worship, the pastor got up, and he pointed his finger at me, and I got my first prophetic word. And he said, he said, the Lord told me to say to you, you'll preach the word, and signs will follow. Now, he didn't know what I'd just gone through, but I had my confirmation. I went to Bible college. I met my husband. We, were, we started pastoring a church two months after we got married. He was 21, and I was 19. 
I still think, God, what were you thinking? <laughs> okay, <laughs> We did not know what we were doing. But we've been in ministry now 38 years, full-time ministry. And we tra- we've traveled to over 60 nations. And sometimes he preaches and sometimes I preach because we're a team. God, see, see how the voice of the Lord prepares a way for you? But let me tell you kind of a, a cool culmination to this whole thing. And, and I, I'm, I'm talking about we just we don't know the effect of what we might consider a little word that we give or a little prayer that we pray. So that man that gave me that word, his name is Eddie Brown, Pastor Eddie Brown. And last year, I was preaching in Columbia, Missouri, 40 years after that word. 40 years after that word. I'm preaching in Columbia, Missouri, 9.15 at night, when who walks through the back door but Eddie Brown. And I recognized him. I'd seen him a couple times, like, in in the 40 years. And I recognized him immediately. And I stopped preaching, and I said, oh, my goodness, is that you, Pastor Eddie? You know what he did? He he, he was in on a cane. He was an older man. He comes in on a cane, and he lifts up his cane, and he says, preach the word, Jane. So he goes over, and he sits down, and... I'm preaching, and I start thinking about this word he gave me. Preach the word, and signs will follow. Preach the word, and signs will follow. And so as soon as I I wrapped up preaching, and I I said, Brother Eddie, could you come up? Could I just prophesy to you? I got to prophesy to the guy that prophesied to me. And as I'm prophesying to him, the Lord starts saying, and the Lord says that I'm, I'm healing the circuitry that's in your brain. There's been some interruptions in the circuitry of your brain. And he must not have been around prophecy because he kept, like, talking to me the whole time I was prophesying. Have you ever been around people that, like, talk to you? They have, like, a running commentary. Oh, yeah, God's talking about it. And I'm just, like, I'm trying to prophesy, okay? And <laughs> he, just, he just kept talking. And so, so, and so when I talk about the circuitry of your brain, he goes, yeah, I, I just had two. He said, I had two strokes five years ago. And, I, and as I'm prophesying and going, oh, okay, that's good. Okay. And the Lord would say, and I'm just kind of trying to stay in the flow here. Uh, And then I just kind of stop and I said, you know, Brother Eddie, you gave me a word 40 years ago that said I would preach the word and signs would follow. I'm activating that word right now. I said, there's a miracle God wants to do in your body. I said, to restore what's been taken by this stroke. What is it? And he said, well, ever since I've had the stroke, he says, I've had no use or feeling in my left arm. It just hangs. There's nothing I can do about it. And so I said, I believe the word of the Lord. You know, we need to war with the prophetic word. Sometimes it's not even warring for ourselves. Sometimes it's taking that, that word and using it as a weapon, using it as a tool in the spirit. So I said, you know what? You gave me a word 40 years ago. I'll preach the word in signs of fall. I activate that right now. And I, and I begin to decree to him complete healing and restoration. And in front of God and everybody that night, within seconds, God completely regenerated his arm. So, so get this. He gave me a word that changed my life. Forty years later, he reaped from that word, and it changed his life. Look at the God. How, how you can't make this stuff up. So you, what you have to understand is that inside your spiritual womb is somebody else's destiny. And when you birth somebody else's destiny, you just never know when that destiny is going to turn around and be a blessing back to you, be a blessing to a nation, be a blessing to the kingdom of God. And so, I, I'm sorry, I just got stuck. I felt like I had to tell you that story this morning. And, and so, I, I want to just read this a little bit um, from Luke chapter 1, because I believe that this is the birthing season, and this is kind of the mentality that we've got to take on ourselves Okay, it says in, the, in verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Um, I believe that in this time, God's going to start sending angels in mass force to this area. You cannot do what God's called you to do here without angelic help. One of the best books I know on the subject right now is Angel Armies by Tim Sheets. I recommend it highly. We actually have a course at, C- at, at um, uh, VLI, 
uh, Vision Leadership Institute that you could talk to Pastor Anna about, that he came and he taught it. But there's angelic interaction. It says that angel, this angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, Rejoice, highly favored one, God is with you. Amen. And the angel said to her, blessed are you among women, women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Remember, God is putting a mantle of favor on this region. God's putting a mantle of favor, just like when Esther came before the king and the king stretched out his scepter of favor and said to her, ask what you want. And she began to tell him her dilemma like you've probably been telling God the dilemma of this region. And the king's response to her was, okay, Esther, you just go ahead and write your own decree. Write a new decree. Write it in the king's name. Seal it with the king's signet ring. Whatever you write, I'll seal it. And whatever I, write, I seal cannot be reversed. Some of you have been waiting on God. God's actually been waiting on you. His scepter is extended. And you're going, but God, I need this. And he's going, okay, write the decree. Okay? And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't even know a man? Have you, has God ever spoken something to you and you just go, how in the world? That's how I felt when God said, you're going to go to the nations of the world and preach. I didn't, even have a, I didn't even have a grid for that when God said it, but I believed it, okay? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Come on, that's the overshadowing presence of God. We cannot do this without the overshadowing presence of God, the anointing of God, the glory of God, the mantle of glory that God wants to put over this region. It says, therefore, that holy one who is to be born is called the son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. Let me just say this. I believe that there's a movement that is getting ready to come on those that are of the older generation. You know, a lot of times when we pray for revival, we pray for the younger generation. And believe me, they need prayers. But how many know that there's a lot of people in their 70s and 80s in this place that still need Jesus? And I just, I just heard the Lord say, I'm going to do a multi-generational thing. It's not just going to be one generation and the, and the upcoming generation. It's not just going to be fathers and children, but it's going to be multi-generations. God is a multi-generational God. He describes himself over and over as a multi-generational God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I believe you're going to see a multi-generational harvest. How many of you still have parents that need the Lord? Okay. How many still have brothers and sisters that are maybe in their 60s, 70s, or 80s? I'm having a really hard time understanding that I'm getting ready, to be, um, that I really am part of that generation. I've already got grandkids, so I guess I'm part of that generation. In my head, I'm still part of the younger generation. Okay. So I like to say that I'm the oldest member of the younger generation. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I believe that there's going to there's gonna be a multi-generational harvest that's going to come. And it says, this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. There's a spirit of barrenness that's being broken off. When we talked about dry bones last night, that word dry bones is translated many times sterile, barren, and unproductive. There's a lot of things spiritually in this region that have been barren, sterile, and unproductive, but I believe that God is breaking barrenness off this region, and I believe God's breaking barrenness off your prayers. God's breaking barrenness off your decrees. God's breaking barrenness off your planted seed, and God's bringing this region into super bloom. How many know a desert looks barren until it super blooms? Come on, get ready for a super bloom season of harvest over this region, because then it says this, for with God nothing shall be impossible. I want you to say that with me. For with God, 
nothing shall be impossible. Let's declare that again over this region. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Say it again. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Father, every well of revival, every well of awakening, every well, Father God, on every college campus, Father God, every university that's gone in a wrong direction, God, there's still a well there that needs to be dug. And we declare the barrenness is coming off this region and we declare that with God nothing shall be impossible and then Mary said behold the maidservant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word church we got to understand God is going to say things over this region that's going to blow your minds and you're going to say how can this be how can it be that God would give a phenomenal harvest out of an area of the country that's arguably housing some of the greatest wickedness? Can we just, I mean, God actually loves those parts in the earth. God loves those places. God loves to take some of the darkest, most bondage-held places and turn them around. There's some of the most spectacular shining lights of transformation that can ever be seen. Can revival come out of New York City? Can it come out of Manhattan? Can it come out of the Bronx? Can revival come out of Staten Island? Can it come out of Brooklyn? Come on, can it come out of uh, Queens? Can it come out of Newark? Come on, can it, can it come out of, I ran out of cities, okay? Sh start, sh can it come out of Camden? Come on, you know what? We've got a church in Camden. And let me just tell you something about the church in Camden that we have, CI's Church in Camden. Um, they moved in there. They, they, start, they planted a church right down on the street that housed all the adult bookstores, all the strip clubs, and all the mob-owned bars. And they started prayer walking that street. I don't know what street it is now, but I don't know if you even know what street it was. Yeah, it might be. I don't, I'm not sure which one it was, okay? But this was 25 years ago. They started coming to CI. They started getting prophecies about taking your city. Let me tell you about Camden. They started walking those streets. They started doing worship on those streets. They started pouring oil on the streets. They did all the crazy prophetic acts that we crazy prophetic people do, okay? They started doing that. They started decreeing, making decrees that some of those businesses were going to start closing down. So the first strip club that closed down, they bought. And they planted a church in a strip club. I'm, I'm not making this up. This is the group that dances at our, at our con that big group that comes and dances at our conference. So most of the elders and leaders in this church are former drug dealers, prostitutes, um, all, all pimps, all that, that would walk those streets and they would blast worship out the doors of their church. Literally, when we went to preach there about 20 years ago, they formed a human shield from the car to the door of the church so that we didn't get shot. Okay? And they told us, y'all too white. That's what they said to us, y'all too white, okay? So we kind of stood out right in that area, Okay? <laughs> and so, so we went in there and, and literally they had just bought the church and I, I literally preached up on a platform that was where you could still see the places in the carpet where they'd taken the dance poles out. And I was preaching up there. I love it. Their whole leadership team is people that got saved off those streets. See, God loves some of the darkest places to shine his light and his glory into. And so one by one, the businesses along that street started closing. Adult bookshops, uh, um, some of the bars were getting busted for not having proper liquor licensing. The, the strip clubs started closing down and they actually closed down by their prayers. They started closing down one after the next business and all those people started getting saved. Some of them got saved and then closed their business. How many know that's the best way to close a business, okay? 
So here, what ended up happening, I don't know, about 10 years ago, is that they, the city came in, bulldozed a whole side of that street, and turned it into a park. And now today, it's a place where families go on Sunday afternoons to have picnics. Come on, can you see what I'm, can you see what I'm talking about? This was like the worst of the worst of the city. And now it's a place where families go to have picnics. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. For with God, nothing is impossible. So I'm totally running out of time, but let me give you three, three quick things because I, I am a teacher at heart. I love to teach. Let me give you three quick things so that we can really kind of come into this transformation. Number one, we've got to learn how to shift into a supernatural mentality, a supernatural mindset. The quicker you shift into a supernatural mindset, what I mean by that is a mindset that says, I'm not limited by what's natural. When you actually believe, how many understand when a virgin conceives, that's not natural. There's been a lot of claims through the, death, through the, through the years that there's been more than one virgin birth, but I can tell you there's only been one virgin birth, okay? All right? And that is supernatural. That defies every law. So we've got to know that God's going to put us in situations where we've got to think out of the box. Come on, like this church in Camden thought outside of the box to say, you know what, God, I want the worst, the darkest, the most demon-possessed, the most, the place where the enemy has built his stronghold so that we can come in, uproot him, and then build a stronghold on top of the place where the enemy has had his stronghold. Come on, in order to do that, you've got to have a supernatural mindset. You've got to believe that what God says is more true than what your circumstance says. We've got to believe like Elisha, surrounded by the enemy, and he prayed for, the, he prayed for, the, uh, for his servant. He said, Lord, I pray open his eyes so that he may see there are more that are with us than are with them. So when I start talking to you about a, a tithe harvest of harvesters coming out of the greater New York region, I just believe that if God, that's what God's saying and that's what we're praying, then that's what God will do. It doesn't make sense, I'm telling you. There has not been one move that we've made in ministry that's ever made sense. Welcome to the supernatural walk. <laughs> And we've got to understand the power that's in our decree. We're talking about closing down businesses in Camden. I'm telling you, Sharon Stone, you brought up Sharon Stone. Um, she, she was listening to some of my teaching that I was teaching out of the Cyrus Decree. And um, in a, a neighboring city, we had a palm reader's business that sat right on the main road. Okay, a spirit, yeah. And so whenever we drive by there, we'd all put our hands out. Even my little kids, they were trained. Lord, we break the spirit of witchcraft and we pray that you'll close that business. We had my children trained to do that when they were little, okay? And so, but one day Sharon Stone pulled up and she was sitting at a traffic light right in front of this place that was there for probably 20 years, a, a palm reader's place of business. And she started to pray the way that we always prayed. Lord, I just pray. I come against the spirit of witchcraft to shut that down. And the Lord stopped her and said, no, stop. Don't pray that way anymore. Pray instead that the source of money that's keeping her in business dries up. <laughs> so that's what she did. Just real quick, sitting at the light. Lord, I just pray that the source of money that's keeping that occult establishment in business dries up. And, and the light hadn't changed yet. But in a, just within seconds of her praying that prayer, the front door on that business flies open and out the front door comes this woman with these long robes and this turban on her head and she walks out on the front porch and she goes, no! And Sharon thought, ooh, we're on to something. <laughs> and I want you to know that within four months, that business was shut down, closed, and that building's completely gone now. We have heard that the palm reader that occupied that business actually heard this story, and she's mad at us. <laughs> but how many know we've got a whole lot more power and authority than we thought we had? Amen? And so we've got to shift into a supernatural mindset that thinks outside of what is natural, what, what is normal. When she made that decree, it cut something off in the spirit that stopped her ability to continue in, in business. A number of years ago, you might have heard, we had a, a massive oil spill along the Gulf Coast. 
It happened off the coast of Louisiana. Sludge came off the Gulf into the estuaries of Louisiana. I'm talking about oil six feet deep in the ocean. Came ashore, just destroyed estuaries. Then it came ashore in Mississippi. Then it came ashore in Alabama. You know what? The church in our area, and when I say the church, I don't mean just our church. I mean the church came together, and we said, you know what? Not on our watch, not on our beaches, not on our shore. And so you know what we did? We had times of prayer corporately. We walked the beaches. We took our church down to the beach. We had church on the beach. Had them put their feet in the, in the waves and stretch their hands out and decree it's not coming here. I want you to know that oil spill came and it sat off our coast. Three to five miles off our coast for two months. Every day they'd say, oh, the wind is going to bring it in ashore. We actually had people in our church that were employed by the disaster cleanup, making 30 bucks an hour, waiting, <laughs> waiting for the oil to come ashore. But my husband and several other pastors went out. I mean, we're talking about Episcopal pastors, Presbyterian. They, you know, everybody's wanting to jump on this, let's pray for our, our city time. They jumped on a boat. They went out and they, they carried on this boat big bottles of anointing oil. And these pastors went out and poured anointing oil on the oil spill oil. And they forbid it to come ashore. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, let me just say this. When Jesus said, Jesus said uh, I give you power to, to bind and to loose. Okay, and literally another translation says that to forbid and to allow. Who? So what are we forbidding and what are we allowing? A lot of the things that we grieve over is just because we didn't know we had the power or the authority to forbid it. So we forbid the oil from coming onto our beaches and it sat off the coast for two months. That's crazy. That's supernatural. And you could even hear the, the, the newscaster saying, it has almost as been as if there is a force field that is keeping the oil from coming ashore. The scientists are baffled. They don't understand what's taking place. And then one week, you know what they start saying? We don't know what's happened to the oil spill. It's disappeared. You know when that happened? That happened after we took a a big party barge full of about 150 people and two giant bags of rock salt. Rock salt. And we went out, you know, remember how Elijah threw salt in the water and made a decree? We had 150 people on a boat. We're just crazy. We're crazy people like that, okay? Because we actually believe this kind of stuff works. And so we drove the boat out, and from the oldest grandma that I think was 106 at the time to the littlest two-year-old that was old enough to speak, we had them taking handfuls and throwing it in the water and saying, making decrees. And I want you to know that oil never came ashore, and that oil completely disappeared. The scientists to this day are baffled, but I'll tell you what happened. With God, all things are possible. We've got to shift into a supernatural mindset. Number two. I'm, I, I, I really do have to catch a plane. Okay, number two is that we got to get our hearts right. We've got to properly position our hearts. You know what's interesting? In Hebrew, the name Mary means bitter, obstinate, and rebellious. Anybody here named Mary? <laughs> Sorry, Mary. <laughs> No comments from the husband, okay? No comments from the husband. Look at this beautiful picture that God chose a woman named Mary that represented all our bitterness, all our rebellion, all our stubbornness and obstinate behavior and chose her to be the one. A lot of times we think our past disqualifies us. When actually if we'll position our hearts, it actually is what qualifies us. But I'm telling you, God will be faithful to take you through the process of conformity to Jesus Christ. 
I know all these things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay? For those he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Your highest calling is to be conformed to the image of God's son. And God does not mind taking you through earth-shaking processes to help shape you more into the image of Christ. I could stand up here for the next several hours and talk to you about earth-shaking situations that we've gone through. We've gone through heartbreak of betrayal in ministry. If you're in ministry long, you'll, you'll go through it. I was just sharing with Josiah. I said, if God had Lucifer and Jesus had Judas, we're probably going to go through some betrayal ourselves. We're going to go through trials that break our hearts that we don't understand. We're going to go through things. But, but one of the things that, that God is looking at in our heart is can we trust God and love God so much that when these things happen, we don't have to say why? See, I believe we've built altars. We want to come to the altar of the Lord, but the problem is we've built altars out of our question marks and altars out of our whys. In other words, I want to come to you, God, but I've got to go through this altar that I've built out of question marks because I don't understand what happened over here. I don't understand the why of what's gone on here. And so it keeps, it acts as a barrier, the altar that we've built. Do you realize that God wants to overthrow idolatrous altars? And sometimes we think, oh, that's out in the world. No, 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 no. God wants to overthrow idolatrous altars in our own hearts that want to get us out of position with God. We got to get over our whys. We got to get over our bitterness. You've got to forgive from the heart. As, as much as CI trains people to hear the voice of God and prophesy and move in the gifts and move in miracles and do all this stuff, you know what else we spend a whole lot of time on? Character. Forgiveness, integrity, being conformed to Christ. Because you know what? You can prophesy great. That's not usually what sidetracks people. It's the character. It's the hard issues. And God will be faithful to test you. I'm sorry if that doesn't go along with your theology. But tell that to Joseph. Tell that to pretty much any great man or woman in the Bible. They're pretty much without exception. They've been through it. And if they've been through it, guess what? We may go through it. One of my most challenging times in my personal life was when um, we, I talked about my children earlier. Um, but when my we we birthed our church in January of 1987, and in February our son was born. We we had two girls. We were excited. We were having a son. We we didn't know back in those days. Younger generation doesn't understand this, but back in those days we didn't actually know what we were going to have. Okay, and so. Um, I, I had a very, very difficult pregnancy. I was on bed rest from 16 weeks. I had a two-and-a-half-year-old and a year-and-a-half-year-old, a year-old um, year, year baby and a two-and-a-half-year-old baby, and I was on bed rest. Number one, I'm not a good bed rest person to start with, okay? Just imagine me on bed rest. That didn't go well, okay? But I was fighting to keep a baby in my, in my womb. And I'd had multiple miscarriages, and, I, and I'd gotten over the grief of that, but now I'm getting ready to birth my child. And he came early, um, but he came with a major facial birth defect. If I could describe it for you, he had no upper lip. He had no hard or soft palate. He had no ability to suck because there was no palate to suck against. The place where his front two teeth grew, grew in a ball off the end of his nose. And when I first laid my eyes on him, I heard the voice of God the second time I heard the audible voice of God. And the Lord said to me very loud that day, he said, Jane, this is not your fault, and you can handle this. And I want you to know at that moment, this amazing love burst into my heart for my son. And we knew we were going to have to have a long process. He ended up having 13 major reconstructive surgeries. 
13, from the time he was five months old to the time he was 18. It was, it was very, very difficult. Difficult for him, difficult for me. But in that first month, the biggest challenge was I couldn't get him to eat. He had no sucking instinct. He had to learn how to chew milk out of a bottle. And they would, they would put, um, they put a plastic like prosthesis in his mouth that would rub blisters so he would bleed the whole time he would eat. It would take me an hour to an hour and a half. Why am I telling you all this? Because it, it was hard. I mean, it was really hard. It would take me an hour to an hour and a half to get him to take an ounce of formula, and then he'd spit it up and I'd have to start again. Oh, did I mention that he also was born without the flap in the back of his throat that differentiated between things going into his stomach versus going into his lungs? So while I was feeding him, he would drown. And I kept hearing the Lord say, you can handle this. We love the glorious words, don't we? That talk to us all about the, the great times. But I'm telling you, it's those words that connect with our heart that carry us through the times that are challenging because you will go through times that are challenging. I'm an optimist. I've always been a very positive, optimistic person. But you go through hard times. And God said to me, you can handle this. Well, I'll tell you. My son got smaller and smaller. He was 7 pounds, 12 ounces a month early. Thank God he was a month early, okay? But by the time he was three weeks old, he weighed less than 6 pounds. He was 5 pounds, 12 ounces. My baby was getting smaller and smaller. They were going to hospitalize him. They were going to put a feeding tube in. And I kept telling the Lord, God, you said I can handle this. And I just kept drawing on the grace of God. And people would come up to me and they'd say, I see that you're smiling on the outside, but you're dying on the inside. And I was like, no, I have this amazing grace, this amazing joy. I have this, this, this thing that God's put in me because God said I could handle this. But I'll tell you, over time, I got tired. And about three and a half weeks along, my son's getting smaller. It's three o'clock in the morning. I've just taken time to feed him, and it took me over an hour to get just an ounce or two down him, and he spits it all up, and I realize I've got to start again, and I'm sitting in my living room, and I start to just cry, and I said to the Lord, God, you said I could handle this, but I can't handle this. This is too hard. This is too hard, and I'm crying, and I'm being pitiful. And I hear the voice of the Lord again. Let me tell you, I, I don't go around hearing the audible voice of God, but I'm telling you the times that I did. In my living room that night, I heard the Lord speak to me. In my grief, in my sorrow, in my difficulty, and here's what the Lord said to me. Stop it, Jane. <laughs> what? Stop it, Jane. I told you you could handle this. Now make a choice. Either you choose to believe what I've said, and I'll give you every bit of grace and joy and sustaining ability that you need to get through this. Or you can choose to go down the road that your emotions want to take you. And I can't go with you there. So make a choice. <laughs> you know what I said? I said... Why are you being so mean to me? <laughs> Why are you being so hard on me? This is hard, God. And you know what the Lord said? Make a choice. <laughs> of course I'm going to choose you, God. Of course I'm going to choose to put it that way. Of course I'll choose you. And I want you to know what happened that night is out of that, even though I thought God was mean to me, <laughs> you know what he needed to do? He needed to like, whoop, like get me back, in, get me back in, in focus. And I want you to know what happened that night. The joy of the Lord flooded me that night, carried away all my grief, carried away all my sorrow, gave me the strength. But here's the other thing that happened. My son began to eat that night began to keep his food down that night, began to grow and grow and grow, and he ate and he ate and he grew and he grew 
and he's a 32-year-old man today, and he still eats out of my refrigerator, okay? He eats and he eats, okay? I, I just want you to understand, it was about my destiny, but it was also about his destiny. And we can talk about glorious ministry, but let me tell you something. If I didn't choose right on that night, I may not be here right now because our life is a series of choices. And on every given choice, every given uh, juncture of your life, you've got to learn to make right choices. You've got to choose God above your emotions. You've got to choose God above your offense. You've got to choose God above your fears. You've got to, you've got to choose his way and his will for your life. You say, well, uh, God hasn't spoken to me in an audible voice. Yes, he has. Read your Bibles. Pick up the word and read your Bibles. Sometimes when we get in a situation where we're hurting, we're waiting for a prophet to come and prophesy to us. And God's saying, I've given you the wealth of the treasure of my word. And I believe we've got to get back to the foundations and the grounding and the founding of the word. And then out of that, God has an avenue to come and speak to us and to come and connect with our hearts. If we're going to change a region, we got to start growing up. We got to start growing up and taking responsibility. We got to deal with our hearts. I can stand here and tell you story after story of people that have been in ministry, that have been great influencers in the kingdom of God, that are doing nothing for God today. Why? Because they let offense get into their heart. They got offended with people. They got offended with God. They got offended with the process. They checked out. They said, if this is the kind of God, I'm not going to serve. I'm just telling you, He, our God is good all the time. Even when God was being straight with me and seemingly mean or hard on me what was he doing he was forcing me to make a right choice and I'm very black and white so guess what God did he gave me a black and white choice make a choice Jane that way or that way God is good all the time but we got to get our heart in position put your hand on your heart just pray in the spirit for just a minute <sighs> Jesus, you want to ruach us. You want to fill us with your breath. You want to fill us with your life. God, Mary's name must have, may have meant bitterness and obstinacy, but Lord, she said, be it unto me according to your word. Be it unto me according to your word. And Father, every one of us, God, have had injuries, have had offenses, have had hurts. And those things can break us and destroy us, or they can make us who we are. Just as you stay in this place of intercession, just let me just say to you, Dutch Sheets' brother Tim um, is an apostle. He's a, a church in Ohio. And he's one of these guys that loves to, like, watch the surgery channel. Are there people in here that like to watch? I actually really like it. I know that's kind of creepy, but I really do like it. Um, and my husband's disgusted by it, okay? But he, he really likes it. And so he has a guy in his church that's a cardiologist. And he said to him, sometime, he said, would it be okay if I came in and watched an open heart surgery? How many think that would be cool? I just think that would be so cool, okay? <laughs> There's always a few in every crowd, okay? Um, and so he made it arrangements. And on the day of the open heart surgery, he put on the mask and the gown and the things over his shoes. And, and the doctor had him come in and stand in this corner. And he said, I'll explain what's, what's happening. And so they came in and they disconnected the woman's heart. And they fixed what was wrong. And then they hooked the heart back up. And then at some point before they closed them up, they take these two little tiny paddles and they shock the heart. And when they shocked the heart the first time, shoo, nothing happened. And so they started massaging the heart. The doctor started massaging the heart. He says, oh, yeah, this happens sometimes. He started massaging the heart. He shocked the heart again. Shoo. Second time, nothing happened. By now, you can kind of feel the tension building in the room because that doctor may have done everything right, but if that heart doesn't start again, A third time, he shocks the heart, and nothing happens. And the doctor looked at the pastor and said, it's time to pray. And he starts massaging the heart, and the pastor's over there praying. And then the doctor does this. He leans down, and he whispers, and he says, Marie, it's time to tell your heart to beat again. And within seconds, boom, 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 boom. 
Come on, church. We got to tell our hearts to beat again. Come on, just begin to tell your heart right now. You've been hurt. Maybe you've been disappointed. Maybe you've gone through a divorce or you've lost a business or you've lost a child or whatever it is. Just speak to your heart and just say, Father, I just, I just command my heart, Lord. Let my heart beat again. I forgive. I release. Now, Lord, just let the healing balm, let your healing oil just come into my heart tonight. Lord, just, just touch me. God, I'm shifting into a supernatural mindset, but God, I need to get my heart in position. And I pray, Father God, that you'll bring the healing necessary so that I can move forward. In Jesus' name. My little grandson, Aiden, his, uh, his mommy was putting him to bed one night. And she told him, Aiden, I'm going to go put your little brother to bed. I do not want to come out here and find you playing in the playroom with your toys. Do you understand? Yes, Mommy, I understand. He's five. Do you understand, Aiden? Stay in your bed. Yes, Mommy, I understand. So she goes and she puts Lucas to bed, and 15 mater- minutes later she comes out, and there's Aiden playing with his cars in the playroom. She says, Aiden, didn't I tell you to stay in your bed? Yes, Mommy. Didn't I tell you I don't want you to come play in the playroom? Yes, Mommy. She said, well, what happened? And he said, well, Mommy... My head told me to stay in bed, but my heart told me to come play. (laughs) How many know Aiden still got a spanking, okay? (laughs) Some of you, your head's telling you one thing and your heart's telling you another, and we need to get get it connected, okay? Now, the last thing I'm going to say is this. We've got to learn to put a demand on the anointing. Just think about this. Mary gave birth to the Son of God. She knew he was the Son of God. She knew he was supernaturally birthed into the world. But she never put a demand on the anointing while he was growing up. Not that we know of. You know? She never put a demand on that supernatural capacity that he had until the day at the Cana wedding. Do you realize that the first miracle that Jesus did was because of his mother? She comes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, they've run out of wine. Understand this, there's a lot of Christians that have run out of wine. If you've run out of wine, maybe you've had wine in the past. I don't mean wine, drinking wine. I mean the wine of the Spirit. Come on. They've run out of wine. A lot of, lot of Christians have run out of wine. And she said, son, they've run out of wine. And you know what Jesus said to her? He said, woman, first of all, I told my son, you ever call me woman? I brought you into this world. I will take you out of this world, okay? You don't ever call me woman. It must be a cultural thing, okay? He said, woman, what does that have to do with me? Listen to what Jesus said. He said, my time, my hour has not yet come. And the very next verse, you see, she turns to the maids and the, and, the, and the servants, and she says, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, I personally believe that there probably was another verse <laughs> between those two, and it probably went something like this. Listen, son, I am your mother. You are going to do this for me, okay? I can't prove that, okay, but that's kind of what I think in my mind. Yeah, she gave him the mom look, okay? Totally gave him the mom look. And Jesus did his first miracle. Now listen, listen. was that miracle anointing there all along? But she never put a demand on it. Jesus even said, it's not time yet, mom. And mom said, I don't care if you think it's time. (laughs) And what did she do? She reached into the future and she pulled it into the now. A lot of you are waiting on a miracle, but you you just haven't learned how to put a demand on the anointing. you got to reach into the future. The church has got to get delivered from a someday mentality, especially prophetic people. Someday this region is going to be transformed. Someday my family is going to get saved. Someday I'm going to get healed. Someday, someday, someday. Someday Jesus is going to be launched into his miracle ministry. Jesus' mother went, no, 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 I'm putting a demand on that. I'm pulling the future into the now, and I'm activating it. And it launched a whole new season. 
So I want you to stand up. You're going to put a demand on the anointing in each other. I think I have to go. Is that true? Okay. Can I finish this if I got time? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a demand on the anointing that's in one another. So here's what I, we're going to do this. We're going to do this in a, I'm going to take you step by step in structure. I want everybody to find somebody to pair up with that's not your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister. You guys just pray better when you're not praying with family. Okay. Familiarity sometimes. Everybody find somebody to pair up with. And what we're going to do is we're going to activate Jonathan or John over here. I don't know which one of him. <laughs> it's a funny story. Okay. Um, but but he, he's been talking all morning like there's such an, an anointing to decree things here. So everybody find one person. If you don't have a person, raise your hand. We'll find you a person. Okay? If you don't have a person, raise it. Okay, everybody got a somebody? Okay, we don't want to, like, little Italian girl saying, uh, everybody got a somebody, I got a nobody. Okay. All right, this woman over here still needs somebody. Is that right? Come on up here. Anybody else? Okay, right there. Right there. Okay, so, ma'am, if you'll turn around and you'll, and then these, oh, wait, you still need somebody? Oh, she still needs somebody. Okay, right over here. We got somebody right over here. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I know that you've done prophetic activation, and this is going to be part of that. But what we're going to do is we're going to make a decree that releases a miracle. And we're going to put a demand on the anointing inside of one another. How many believe that the person you're... Okay, well, let's just do this. Uh, watch the mouth of the person whose hand you're holding when I ask this question. Are you a born-again member of the body of Christ? If so, say amen. They didn't say amen. If they didn't say amen, just go ahead and lead them to the Lord right now, okay? And that'll be your activation, okay? All right, now, here's what we're going to do. Recognize, first of all, that the Spirit of God lives inside that person. And you're going to put a demand on it. Maybe they've never done a miracle before, but today could be the day. You saw Jonathan move in the miraculous, right? You saw him do miracles. That's, remember, and he, and he taught you that everybody can prophesy? Well, everybody can move in miracles. Yeah. Every single one of you can move in miracles. And so... What we're going to do is we're going to start out by doing this. I want you to identify one area of your life that you really need a miracle in. Family, finances, health, something specific. Okay, think about that. Okay, now we're going to take just a couple seconds in a matter of four or five words to describe the miracle that you're believing for to that person. Don't be like, well, when I was five. Okay, don't go like through your life story, okay? Just like, a, like I need healing in my back or I need my family to get saved or I need something, whatever that is, okay? Identify that one area. Now take just a couple seconds and share it back and forth. Everybody here is going to get miracles. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, one of you share, then the other person share. This is not the activation. This is not what we're doing. This is just giving you the clue to what we're doing. Okay. Shh. I learned that from my school teacher daughter-in-law. Shh. Okay. Everybody got it? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment and we're going to pray in tongues. Because it says when we pray in tongues, we activate our faith. Okay, and we activate the dunamis power of God, which is a miracle working power. Then what we are going to do is we are not going to pray for each other. Do you know it doesn't say that Jesus prayed for the sick? No place does it say Jesus prayed for the sick. No place are we commanded to pray for this. Well, with the elders to pray for the sick, but it says we're to heal the sick. Okay, and Jesus never prayed. He made decrees. So we know that, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make a decree. So in just a moment, we're going to release you. We're going to pray in the Spirit, and then we're going to release you. And you're going to decree. And this is what we're going to do. When John and Peter were walking by the gate, beautiful in Acts chapter 3, there was a lame man sitting by the road, and he was crying out for alms. And Peter said, basically, you know, I don't have any money to give you, but what I've got to give you will change your life, right? But the first thing that Peter said is, look at me. And the man looked at him as though he expected to receive something, is what the Bible says. So in this activation, we are not going to close our eyes. We're going to make eye-to-eye -eye contact, okay? That means that both of you have to keep your eyes open, all right? 
and then we're going to release a decree. Now, if they need healing in their shoulder, you're going to start speaking to the shoulder. You're going to start decreeing a, a health into the shoulder, into the tissue, into the muscle. You're going to start to declare. You're going to start to decree. You're going to release what you want to see happen, what you believe God is saying you see happen. See, the worlds were framed by the word of God. The miracles that we're receiving are framed by the anointing of the spirit that comes out of our mouth. Okay? So we're going to have you keep your eyes open. We're going to have you decree and not pray. And the third thing is we're going to give you permission to do something that your mama probably told you not to do, but we'll give you permission to do it on this activation is that if you feel like you need to and you feel like it'll increase the anointing, we're going to allow you to point your finger. Okay? <laughs> Woman? <laughs> Are you all ready? There's, there's so much faith for miracles in this room right now. There's so much faith for release. So pray in the Holy Ghost with me for just a second. Sheke para basanda, rebe de boshoto da diate ke seke para basanda, rebe babara da diato ko shoko para da basanda, rebe babara da basondo da bara bara diate, shanda da baka, shanda da baka, shanda, rimba da ka shanda da baka, shanda, kindo da boko shoto da bara da basanda. Okay, go quiet for just a minute. Go quiet for just a minute. Now, as you begin to make your decree, just let just open up that prophetic gift and just let that flow as you begin to decree. One of you say, I volunteer to go first. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. All right. So when you go first, you can lay your hand on their shoulder, lay your hand on their head, or just go ahead and hold hands with them. But I want you to lock eyes with them all over this place right now. Both eyes open. Look right into their eyes and say, I decree to you in the name of Jesus and release your decree. Are you ready? One, two, three, decree. Come on, let me hear you. Decree with authority. Keep your eyes open. Eyes open. Decree with authority. When one of you is done, the other person, go ahead and release a decree. Decree with all authority. Keep your eyes open. Eyes open. If the first person is still decreeing, go ahead and shift to let the second person decree. If the first person is still going, make a shift. Release the force of God. Release that miracle force. Release the decree of God. Release the spirit of breakthrough. There's breakthrough happening right now. There's bodies being healed. There's resources being released. 
There's divine connections that are coming. There's family members that are being delivered. Come on, there's miracles being set in motion by these decrees. Father, we just decree right now, Father God, Lord, that there's supernatural shift, a supernatural divine reversal, God, that you are making over our lives and over our hearts, Father God. We thank you for that right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's thank the Lord. Father, we're so grateful. I want you to just say, Lord, I receive my miracle. God, I receive my breakthrough. God, I receive that which you promised to me. I receive this anointing today, Father. I thank you, God, that you're birthing something in the wombs of these individuals so that they can birth destiny even in the hearts and the lives of others. Father God, to see this region radically, radically revived by the Spirit of God, by the anointing of the Spirit. Come on, let's thank the Lord and let's thank that person one more time. Father, we're just so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm telling you that you're in a season that God's taking you from glory to glory. You don't want to miss anything that God's got for you. I encourage you, if you're not connected to a good apostolic prophetic house, this is the time that you cannot afford to be not connected, okay? You've got to get connected. So, Father, I just thank you, God, for the wind of the Spirit and the fire of God blowing over this region, God, that, Lord, that you're going to be the fire around about them and the glory in their midst, Father. We loose it in the Spirit now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen.